VoiceOver Coffee Shop, episode number 39. Welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we share our morning with some of the finest names in VoiceOver. And now, here's your host, voice actor Andrew Morrison. Hi there, my name is Andrew Morrison, and welcome to the VoiceOver Coffee Shop, where we start our day with some of the finest names in voiceover. If you'd like to get to know a little bit more about me, please feel free to check out my website at www.andrewdmorrison.com. In this episode, we have my very, very dear friend, Jonathan Bullock. Jonathan is known for his roles as Cthulhu in The Legend of the Winged Guardian, Captain Rogers in Starfighter Origins, as well as Badlands Vulcan and Galactic Void Chernabog in the game Smite. In addition to his numerous game and TV titles, Jonathan is also a coach specializing in vocal and career classes, and a demo producer. In this episode, we talk about acting delivery styles, the mind of a demo producer, and how small changes can make a big impact. Hello, hello. Glad to be here. Good to have you, man. How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Yeah, I've uh, got most of my voiceover done for the day, so got a nice little break going on. What were you working on today? Um, I had some narration stuff. I had um, some industrial um, projects as well that I was working on. Uh, but other than that, yeah. Gotcha. So how do you take your coffee in the morning? Actually, <laughs> I don't like coffee. I've tried. I've tried to like it, but I just cannot bring myself to. Well, well, how do you start your day? How does the day of Jonathan Bullock voice actor like like start off? Gotcha. Um, yeah. So generally, I'll wake up in the morning, and a couple of my clients reach out to me through Facebook, usually around. 10 in the morning they're like hey can you get this back to us by such and such um so i'll you know have some water uh do some warm-ups and pretty much hop right into it fantastic so what is your like genesis origin story how did you get started in the world of vo okay yeah um so it's a little random. Um, I'm not sure if you remember who Masako X was. He was yeah. part of mm -hmm. uh, Team Four Star, Dragon Ball Z, a bridge, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, about 10 or 11 years ago, he uh, was posting some videos to his YouTube channel. I was like, oh, this guy's cool. He does voiceover. That seems, you know, like a pretty interesting career. His videos are funny. Uh, let's check this out. So it's a, it was four uh, videos on his blip.tv page on how to do voiceover, how to change your tone, pitch differences, character differences, um, stuff like that. And I watched them all and I was really, I found it really intriguing. I was like, I could totally do this. So back in the good old days of the voice acting alliance, I, you know, made my account on there, started to find some little fan projects, started uh, auditioning for those. Um, my very first audition I ever did was actually a live audition because I was like, I don't know if I'm good enough to record on my own. Uh. So I figured, <laughs> being an introvert, you know what, let's just throw myself right into the middle of it and just talk to people directly. So my right. first audition, I had live direction. And, you know, I was just starting this as a hobby. I didn't really think much of it. I was like, oh, maybe I can make some like abridged videos or voices and something like that. Um, and so I auditioned for this person. They're like, wow, how long have you been doing this? You're really good. I'm like, oh, uh, two days. <laughs> and so that was really encouraging. And so I just stuck with it. Do you think there was any like prior training that you did before that kind of gave you that actor's intuition? Because I've noticed that with a lot of people where whether it's just mimicking things on TV to taking theater classes, like there's there's a lot of different ways where people build this intuition to where even when they begin in voiceover, even on their first day behind the mic, it just starts to like come naturally. Right. Yeah, I didn't take any theater classes. Um in high school, I didn't do a whole lot of anything except AP classes. Um, but my senior year, I decided, you know what? Um, my friend's been wanting me to do marching band with them. So I joined that, and I was like, 
huh, that's kind of fun. Maybe I could try, you know, theater. It's my last year. No one's going to remember this. No one's going to, you know, think I'm stupid for doing this. So right. I happened to do the first play the school was doing with their new director. And their new director was, um, he. I think he came from Broadway or maybe off-Broadway to come teach. And so the first show we did was uh, Kiss Me, Kate. And uh, that's how I, you know, discovered a love for musicals. And I started doing, you know, theater after that. But I really hadn't had any um, experience besides that. So have you done any musicals since you, you started your VO venture? Uh, yeah, I've done a few. Um, tw I think I started doing them. I graduated 2011 from high school. And I think in about 2013, maybe 2014, I found a community theater group that I did uh, three or four shows with. My last one with them was Oklahoma, okay. which was a lot of fun. And we did, um, there's this one scene in Oklahoma where there's basically the whole show is about the farmers versus like the ranchers and like cattle and stuff. And so there's this one scene where they all get into a fight. And so, you know, after doing three or four of these, sh these shows, we're, you know, maybe not taking it as seriously as we could have. And so all the fights and stuff were choreographed. So it's like, oh, throw a punch to the right of them, left of them, blah, blah, blah. And there's that whole thing. And so someone came up with the idea, you know what, guys? What if we just, like, it's a last, second to last show. Why don't we just dogpile? <laughs> so everyone's, like, <laughs> doing this, the first part of the fight and it's like okay yeah that's cool and someone from the back yells dog pile <laughs> so boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and that's uh that was a really fun show and then i after that i did the virginia premiere of newsies which was my first professional show uh, about three years ago um do you have a video copy of the dog pile for me to put into the show notes dude or i <laughs> wish i wish i had a copy of that in fact, they actually, I believe they filmed some of them, but they did not get that one. Gotcha. So how do you feel like your, your career has progressed? Like you went from doing little fan-made stuff. Like what, what's the bulk of your work these days? Because I know you do a, a, a good bit of video game work. You do at least, what, like two or three video game, major video games a year. So where, where does the, the bulk of your work come from? Honestly, I have one very consistent client who sends me stuff daily, like maybe three or four projects a day. So they keep me pretty busy, so much so that I, you know, don't do a whole lot of marketing so much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I just got a new agent today. Actually, now that oh. I think about it. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, thanks. Um, but most of that work is like industrial narration like hello we're a company we make things we have good service <laughs> um and then i have a the other side of things is you know more commercial side um and i've done stuff for with circle k i've done bojangles virginia lottery um ikea that was a fun one um just just a, a whole bunch of random stuff and every once in a while you know, I'll get a really fun character role to work on. Um, of course, I'd, you know, love to work primarily in animation slash video games. But since I'm still on the East Coast currently, I'm not exactly in that sphere ex as much as I'd like. Well, I mean, with the way the world has changed now, a lot of doors have, like, opened up. Have you thought of, like, auditioning or reaching out to the studios on the West Coast? Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, emailed Formosa, I've emailed a good chunk of them, um, which I haven't heard back from them, but from what I hear about Formosa, it's mostly referral-based. Right. So, but, you know, I'd love to be engaged in it back. This is true. So, with your love for animation and video games, I named off some of the characters that you're quote-unquote well-known for, but what were, like, some of your favorite characters to to play, whether it was just a really fun character or when you, right when you got that script, you're like, oh, no, this is me. Like, this is, this is my character. Right. Yeah, so... The first Smite role I got, which was for a Vulcan skin, which is Badlands Vulcan, mm -hmm. um, the audition direction was... You know, give us Mad Max, Sandy, Rough, Guttural. 
And, you know, I didn't usually get cast for that at the time. And so, you know, I was trying, I was like, I'm angry, bah! And so, I was like, you know, I can really, I can do a lot better than this. So I, you know, threw my entire self at it. And I was like, if I don't get this, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, this is, this is the top tier of my, of my uh, work quality at the time. And I, I did, I got it. And I was really excited and shocked um, to get something. That was my, one of my first uh, mid to high level games that I worked on. So you also do a, a good bit of uh, both vocal and business coaching. How, how did you start the the coaching journey in your career? Um, so I've since I've been doing this for for ten years, I kind of forgot how much stuff I actually know. And so you know, I was talking to like a couple people who are you know newer in the industry, and I was you know just throwing out this advice, and I was like, "That's solid." You know, I I guess I know more than I thought I did. This is just this basic stuff that kind of just you gloss over right. that, you know, people who don't have a background in it or like no no radio history or anything like that wouldn't wouldn't know like technique, um, stereotypically like how a bunch of commercials and shows um acting styles and pacing and stuff. Like, you know, you have a the difference between let's say uh Kingdom Hearts delivery versus uh, let's say Dragon Prince, uh, which is an animated show on Netflix. I believe they've the same group that worked on Avatar, I believe. Mm -hmm. It sure is. Yeah. And um, Dragon Prince is actually a show that I recommend my students go through if they're wanting to get a better grasp of character because it's got this nice, almost theater-esque balance of, you know, realistic delivery but with interest, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, um, I just started on this one website that um, is like a hub for teachers of different stuff, and so I just had people start reaching out to me. It's like, hey, um, I'm really interested in this. How do I get started? And then I'll, you know, have an hour long Zoom session with people and get started, kind of figure out what they're wanting to get out of everything, um, where they want to be. And I just finished not super long ago, my first student's commercial demo. And I'm very, very proud of them. They, they worked really hard to, to get that out. Awesome. So what are some of the basic fundamentals that you teach that you think, um, vetted voiceover artists just kind of like gloss over because it come becomes second nature? Um, something that probably gets forgotten as you, you know, get into character work mm -hmm. would be just having different, the same delivery with different sound. So like saying something like the king is dead, which is, you know, a, a pretty flat delivery versus and, you know it's not kind of a nondescript kind of like probably would be like an extra kind of voice versus using us like a like an a sound or e sound o sound i sound u sound um to change the character just like a slight way so you have if you're using like an i sound like the king is dead you'd have a kind of a prissy kind of trying to be elegant maybe a kind of suck up character versus uh if you're using something doing it with like o sound you might have like a, a general or soldier or something strong, like the king is dead. Um, stuff like that. Um, and then when it comes to commercial, um, pretty much just being aware of the different genres of delivery. Like, for instance, you're not going to say, let's see some kind of emotional line with let's see let's let's say pampers um so right you're not gonna say pampers pamper the skin they're in and have it be you know too light and peppy for you know for most taglines you're gonna want something either 
emotional in some way or have that authenticity in there. So like you'd want something more like Pampers. Pamper the skin they're in. You know? Right. You want you want more of that emotional feeling, but yeah. No, I'm right. I'm a big fan of authentic reads, especially nowadays with the the millennial buyer's market that we're sure. now living in. Because I mean Millennials can spell smell bullshit a mile away, <laughs> and they it, it, we're over that hard sell, hard sell. Come and get this now, except for like the radio. Unless commercial. you're a car dealership, right? Unless you're a car dealership, or like most radio commercials, where the same radio guy is doing it over and over and over again. A lot of newer commercials are more of that. Here's the information. Here's how we're gonna present it. Buy it or don't buy it. But here's how we feel about it, and here's how we authentically feel about this product yeah no absolutely so how did you how did you get into demo production uh demo production i've actually worked on demos for quite a bit i started out you know i made my first demo in 2013 started in 2011 when i started feeling company it's like you know what my voice is I'm, i'm happy with my voice let's see you know what i can do with it i need to use this so i can audition for stuff or getting these talent pools back when <laughs> most of the talent pools and now like sound cadence coach uh extra terrible stuff like that they have a lot higher and stricter standards um versus back when things were first starting out um but i made two demos in 2013 two demos in 2015 and then someone i knew who was already doing voiceover and um, mostly fan projects, but an indie game from here and there was like, Hey, this, um, company really wants a demo. What can, is like, could you help? I know you've made your own demos. And I was like, sure. So I, you know, wrote it, um, went over it with them. Do you like this spot? Does this, do you think this sounds good? Um, and I usually try to keep a pretty consistent group of, reads like you're gonna have your um emotional outburst or like grief um maybe some kind of burly creature if you're a guy or maybe something cutesy if you're a girl um something military um something more animated and energetic and then i usually add some kind of battle yell or or like a spell in there for fun um, and I like, I, I like trying to tell a story through the demo. In fact, speaking of stories through demo, if you've ever heard Ben Diskin's demo, um, at least his old one that they had on CESD, his entire demo was him speaking to himself as different characters. And so he'd do the entire line up to the last word. And then the last word would start a new character. And it was like a three minute demo of just like each one completely different. I was like, <laughs> so that was, wow. that was really interesting That's to hear. That's a bold move. Yeah. Yeah. He, I think it's him and Bryce Pappenbrook. Maybe it's just Bryce. I think it's, it might've been just Bryce, but I remember I interviewed Bryce a long time ago or, or someone I know uh, did with me and he was talking about how when his parents were working, because his dad was a, a voice actor, um, his agent was like, hey, let me know when your son's ready to do this and we'll sign him. <laughs> so, Jeez. born into it. Right. Absolutely. So how do you feel like your demo production has grown over the years could there have been there obviously have to have been some things that you've learned new as you're doing it just like any field so what are some of the things the do's and don'ts that you've learned over the past couple of years sure um for me it's mostly about just knowing what goes with what kind of spot Mm -hmm. um i like to write to the music so it seems like it's almost cinematic in a way um even though music's usually put in after Mm -hmm. um and then writing off of that mood and energy in the music helps a lot Um, i graduated with a degree in audio and video production Mm -hmm. so that certainly helped you know just getting to know eq and stuff like that and just knowing what to 
alter and how to make the vocals stand out from the music more like you know panning to two tracks to left and right and then one center which makes the voice stand out a whole lot more and doesn't get you know lost in the the, the music track gotcha okay and so going back onto the big and burly side uh, i know you and i were just in a class together where we were going over different creature and monster noises and things of that nature what are some different things that you have learned to kind of save your throat when it comes to bigger and, and deeper characters i personally try to keep the vibration of it at a lower level and not throw myself into it as deep as I used to. I used to be like, let's blast it, 100% power, let's go. But right. you, you you, can't. You can't do that, one, for <laughs> very long. you wake up the next morning, you can't do an e-learning module, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and that was something I had to relearn a good couple of years ago. I was like, oh, maybe I'm trying too hard. <laughs> so... Um, but yeah, um, I would definitely recommend Michael Schwable's class for, you know, ex I believe he calls it Extreme Vocals and, mm -hmm. and Creatures. Um, him, or he has done just tons of deeper um, and yeah, he, just creature voices. He, he did... He voiced over 200 creatures in one video game. Yeah, I actually yeah. played... Uh, what's the name of the thing? The Spire? Slay the Spire. Um, a couple days ago, and it was interesting to, you know, hear him knowing that that was him, because mm -hmm. um, I had no idea. Um, and I believe his wife's also like a vocal teacher or coach, so okay. they've got you know their background in it. So they know what they're talking hand, about. Right? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's just it's just a process. I mean, you can take all the classes in the world, but you got to do a lot of experimentation on your own. Mm -hmm. Everybody's um, voice is different. Yeah, even when I was a kid, like, I used to try to make impressions of, like, cartoon characters and stuff like that. And, I, you know, I didn't think much of it, and eventually I stopped once I became, like, a teenager. Mm. Um, and the first character that I learned an impression for coming back to voiceover was Roxas from Kingdom Hearts 2. And I was like, oh, hey. you know, my impression's pretty close. Um, so I did tons of Roxas content for a while. <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it's really interesting how, you know, things come together. I found out like two or three years into voiceover that uh, I'm actually adopted and I found out my birth mother also does voiceover. Really? And I had no idea. Um... And I met her a couple years after I found that out and, you know, just, just talked about stuff for like a long time. She, you know, pushed me to get my first commercial demo and she's, she's really like supported me through this and, um, yeah, she's been, a, she's been really great. That's awesome. So what are some of the the biggest things that you've learned over the past couple of years in voiceover? Because everybody just has different things that they end up taking home with them, whether it's focusing on the community of voiceover or or how they've grown audio engineering wise. What, what are some of the biggest things that have helped impact you and, and grow you in your career? Sure. Um, a lot of self-exploration and experimentation, as I said earlier trying to find out what your voice can do um and how to make small changes and pretty much just not worrying so hard about where you are currently with your you know career progress mm -hmm. and you know not comparing yourself to others because you know your everyone's journey is going to be different to get there some people get there within a year some people it takes a really long time and it's it's all just about consistency and you know there is some truth to uh, you know you, you have to make your own path and make your own like career decisions right. but i think it's really important to really get involved in the community 
and you know make make friends i mean it's it's you can bounce ideas off people you can do a lot of like fun practices you can go over scripts um share you know agents that you're you're with that you think that would be a good fit for you know other people that you know and something that i saw a bit ago on twitter that's that's really different about the voiceover community versus say like live action acting community mm -hmm. or um is that actors remember or voice actors remember where they came from and so a lot of them are really willing to kind of the term they use was send the elevator back down um and and just make opportunities for you know new blood to to make it to have a have a chance um but it's it's also very important to stick to what you believe and not you know make compromises just to be a cool or like accepted because you're going to find that people when you know when you're making friends you're going to want that authentic real connection and and friendship that it's the friendships that you're going to make and without having some vulnerability and openness to others you're just not going to you're not going to be where you want to be you're not going to have that community that you that you want so it's really important to make good friends and you know stick to them and just just be loyal and you know honestly be happy for people not be jealous and you know celebrate other people's success yeah no you were my idea bouncer what like three or four years ago when when i first jumped into this game yeah no absolutely so if you could go back in time to before you started voiceover and you could write a message to yourself and then send it back what would you go and tell yourself don't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no, honestly, what I would say is try to take it a bit more seriously and take critiques <laughs> in an open-minded way. Oh, um, oh, yeah. Don't get don't get so stuck on your or one particular idea for a character because there's an unlimited amount of choices you can make per character. And the greatest tip that helped me a lot was about conversational reads. And I talked to Matt Curtis about this, who works with uh, J. Michael. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he does their animation demo department. Correct, yeah. And I was just bouncing ideas. I was like, hey, um, what's your like idea of a conversational read? Because I had gotten lost in this really bad habit of making it almost film-like in it in in dryness mm -hmm. and so when they're they ask in these audition emails no announcers they're just saying don't give us any sunday 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 they just want something that's right. like yeah jeff peanut butter you know i take care of my kids they want something casual not something so 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 real that it's boring right yeah, and that's really important, a really important thing to know, because I feel like a lot of people do get stuck in there because it is so unclear what the conversational read is. Mm -hmm. So that's a very important thing to to be aware of. And it applies to character work, commercial work, everything, really. <sighs> so um, also, I probably would have encouraged myself to buy a booth a lot sooner. Um because that would have pushed me harder to take it seriously sooner. Gotcha. So where can people find you in all of your glory? Okay. Uh, yeah, I am on Twitter at, at John David Talent. I have LinkedIn, which is Jonathan Bullock VoiceOver. Um, then I have my website, www.jonathanbullockvo.com. And I've got you know my resume on there. I've got my my demos and yeah i'm i'm really proud of my website i put a lot put a lot of work into it yeah it's beautiful it's really well done thanks all right man well thanks for coming on the show this has been a blast dude awesome it's been fun thanks 
and then this is where I go on the pre-recorded. I really hope you enjoyed listening to Jonathan talk about blah 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 blah. If you'd like to know more information, blah 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 blah. Yeah. So, but yeah, man, this has been blast. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I really hope you enjoyed listening to Jonathan's perspective on how throwing yourself into your career and putting the work into your craft every day can open doors you never could have imagined possible. If you'd like to know more about him and his work, you can visit him at www.jonathanbullockvo.com. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The VoiceOver Coffee Shop. For more information on guests, new episodes, and more, be sure to visit www.vocoffeeshop.com.